We have the pleasure of welcoming Lou Adler today to our interview series, Lead Us Home. I'm Aishwarya Jain from the People Home team. Before we begin, just a quick intro of People Home. People Home is an end-to-end, one-view integrated human capital management automation platform, the winner of the 2019 Global Cody Award for HCM that is specifically built for crafted employee experiences and the future of work with AI and automation technologies. We run the People Home blog and video channel which receives upwards of 200,000 visitors a year and publish around two interviews with well-known names globally every month. And now for our guest Lou Adler. He is a well-known name in the field of hiring. With his experience, he's been helping global companies find the right talent and invest correctly in their human capital. Lou is the CEO and the founder of the Adler Group, which helps multinational companies to hire exceptional talent. The author of the Amazon Top 10 bestsellers, Hire With Your Head, Lou has been featured on famous publishings like Link Inc, Magazine, Business Insider, and the Wall Street Journal. An experienced corporate executive turned entrepreneur, we welcome Lou Adler to our interview series. Welcome, Lou. We're thrilled to have you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Hopefully, I can be helpful to your audience. Of course. Thank you so much. So, the first question I had for you, Lou, was tell us something about your journey that brought you to starting the Adler Group. Boy, that's a, you want the long story or the short story? We prefer whatever you give us. <laughs> well, hey, Ken, we could be on for three, four hours, so we won't do that. I'll give you the, the super short version. Uh, so I'm, I've not been a recruiter my whole life, but I've been a recruiter for more than 40 years. But for the 10 years prior to that, I actually worked in industry and was running a manufacturing company when I was 32 years old. And I hated my boss, who was the president, the group president. And we argued every week. And I finally quit four times in one year and said, I'll become a recruiter. But it was really only to find another job. And I started up with these two other guys who were very good. And I quickly realized that recruiting was a true business process. And I actually liked it and uh, started placing people in industries and companies that I knew since I'd been in manufacturing and finance and accounting. So it was easy for me to know. I knew a lot of people and started getting a lot of assignments. And I realized over time there was a right way to do it. And the right way is starting with a clear understanding of the job, a good interviewing process, a good sourcing process, a good closing process. And also the big most important point, you have to deliver on the promise. Because as a recruiter, you're affecting a person's life. And if you don't know the job, it's, you're just playing games. Uh, but if you do know the job and you understand this career, this person's career aspirations, and you can put both people together, you actually can play a very important benefit both to the hiring manager, the candidate, and the company, uh, and to that that person's life that you're presenting and his or her family. So that's an important role, and I don't think enough recruiters take it seriously enough. And it took me a lot of years to figure out how to do it, but I take it still seriously today. Uh, and I think that's the message that I like to try to present to everybody. That's wonderful. And talking about the interview process, uh, so I was just going through your article that you posted a few hours back on LinkedIn, right? The phone screening process. Um, so you talk about, you know, how it has to be a good culture fit. You need to determine, um, you know, the level of, uh, you know, the if the person fits the culture and the hiring manager, what's the specific fit and motivation? So what happens usually is that the person talks a lot about, you know, they've done X project and Y project, but how do you really differentiate from the truth versus what's false? Is there a process for that? Well, sure, but um, there's more to the phone screen than just assessing competency. But it's a, particularly now when you can't talk to people in person, it's an important component irrespective of that. At the fundamental but not most important issue is understanding if this candidate, which is the answer to your question, is competent to do that work and motivated to do that work. And if the job represents a career move and worth spending more time with the person, it is not the decision to hire or not hire the person. The decision is to collect evidence to determine if it's worth getting serious about this person and if the person should be serious about what you have to offer. 
And the way I conduct a phone screen starts be long before the phone screen. It's me asking the hiring manager, what does success look like on the job? And it could be some type of project. It could be some type of work. And I then say, what does it take to be really successful? Or what are the best people do the, doing this work do? And frequently, it's objectives. Build a team of accountants to launch a new product, a new accounting report. Uh, design a new component that does A, B, and C and work with manufacturing and uh, sales to make sure it's appropriate for the marketplace. But it's usually a series of activities. Once I know that, I use the phone screen to ask the candidate, hey, we have to build this new project. We have to handle a work like this. Tell me about work you've done just like that. So my phone screen is first to go through the person's background, understand their track record, see if there's a general fit uh, between the job and the candidate, and if this work the candidate has done is comparable to the work that needs to be done. So it's very practical stuff. And they, in, in that case, I then determine if the candidate would see this job as a career move or a lateral transfer. If it's a career move, I would want to go forward. If it's not a, if it's not a perfect job, meaning the candidate's not competent, I'm going to stop. If the job's not a career move, I'm going to stop as well. Um, but that's all you can get in the first interview in the phone screen is a general understanding if it makes sense to get serious. I tend to like the hiring manager to also conduct a phone screen to dig deep into areas that I, as a recruiter, didn't cover. And then when we invite a person on site, we actually have a lot done. But surrounding that whole idea is the idea of I want to convert that stranger whom I don't know. I just met him on the phone or in a phone call or a video interview. I want to convert that stranger into an acquaintance of some type. So we use the phone screen to get to know each other as people. Not only is this person competent and motivated, but when you know someone on the phone, uh, it's a little bit different than meeting them in person. In person, you're biased by the person's first impression, how prepared they are, how if they arrive on time. It says all these superficialities that take place when you meet a person in person, particularly if that person really wants that job. So I say slow down spend more time with fewer people, use the phone screen as to get to know each other, as, as well as, hey, should we get serious? So I think when we, we sell the phone screen as a conversational component, as well as an assessment component, and I think that's the bigger purpose of it, as aside from, hey, is this person competent and motivated to do the work? So, it's, But it's just the first step. Sorry for that long answer, but it's probably appropriate. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And do you believe that, you know, there are certainly a lot of biases when you see the person in front of you, right? So do you believe that we actually make a decision right in the first five seconds of seeing that person, whether it's a yes or no? Absolutely. In fact, I remember making a decision before I even met the person. I was downtown Los Angeles, this was 25 years ago or so, and I got in early morning for a meeting. I left the office door locked and I knew the candidate was coming in at 7.30 in the morning. And I was waiting for him and it was 7.31 or so. And I see the candidate couldn't even get the door open. I said, oh, what an idiot this person is. I didn't even like the person and it had nothing to do with it. He couldn't, it was my fault, I left the door locked. Uh, I was the only one in the office. So the, that's part of the reason why I like a phone screen is there's two reasons why we make mistakes. Number one is we don't know the job. And it's a lot to know the job, the culture, the company, the decisions, there's a lot of things associated with that. But if you don't know the job, it's problematic if the person's going to be successful. But then we use the interview when we meet the person to make a decision, should we hire this person or not? And we do make a decision instantly. That's why the phone screen is a good way. And I say, whether it's a phone screen or in person, that use the interview to collect evidence to make a decision. Don't make the decision during the interview. So we have this semi-scripted interview, which is very natural conversation, uh, but we want to collect evidence. At the end of that interview, we'll say, hey, could this person do this job? Is this person's first impression appropriate? And by the end of the interview, most people calm down. People who make a great first impression but are superficial, you recognize their superficialities. Uh, 
but if you use the interview to collect the evidence rather than make a decision, you're better off. And I think that's what too many people make the decision. That's why the other part of the phone screen is it minimizes first impression bias, which is absolutely critical and damaging to make an assessment. Absolutely, right. I agree with you. It would be really critical and we need to pay more attention to the phone screen part of it than probably the interview itself to remove all kinds of biases. So you do validation from by doing the phone screen and then actually go ahead and, you know, kind of say yes or no when the person comes in. Right. So, um, you know, hiring right is definitely a huge problem for all organizations worldwide. And especially in this time of the pandemic, what would be your advice that you'd give to organizations that have to continue hiring? You mean in the current healthcare crisis? Right. Okay. Well, somebody just asked me that and we had a training program an hour ago and somebody asked that and I said, well, my philosophy as a recruiter is I'm affecting a person's life. And I do not want to put a person into a situation that's more risky than the person in the situation today. Normally, we don't have this kind of healthcare crisis going on. So when I look at a candidate, even if that person's happily employed, and I'm going to put them into something else, and any just changing jobs is a risk, so we try to mitigate that risk to the degree possible. And I have a philosophy is we're not hiring for the start date. We're hiring for the anniversary date a year later, which means you do a lot of due diligence. Is the job right? Is the person's fit right? Is the person motivated right? There's all these other factors that you have to consider when you hire for the anniversary date. It's a lot of work. So I told this person this morning, she said she's a recruiter and she's got a couple of candidates on the line. What did I think about it? I said, well, my personal position is I do not want to put a person in a more risky position uh, than they are in today. So I would just personally back off. I know that would be painful for as a recruiter because I get paid for that. Uh, but on the other hand, if you look at the larger consequence of that is you're affecting a person's life and that person's family's life. On the other hand, if that person is out of work and you're putting them into a situation, well, that's still a better situation. If their situation is currently risky and you're putting them into a less risky situation, you, I'm certainly fine with that. So the idea is we like to have people look at the job for what they're gonna be doing and becoming in comparison to where they are today and where they're gonna be going if they stay there. So it's that, it's, that's why there's a lot of work here and I don't like to rush it. I spend more time with fewer people uh, and I want them to recognize it's a serious life decision, not just they take the job because one wants more money. And I think that's when you understand the job, you understand human nature, you understand every, all these other factors, you gotta bring them all together. But you as a recruiter are orchestrating this whole process and there's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. And I think, unfortunately, too many hiring managers and too many candidates and too many recruiters do it for what they got on the start date, not for the anniversary date. And that's a whole game changer when you do it that way. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, too many chefs would spoil the broth. You know, it's kind of the, that situation. So what you're trying to say is that it, it is a human experience and we've got to be empathizing with everybody's situation and backgrounds. Which Absolutely. Really right. Absolutely. And can you give us some insights on hiring the right talent for the concept of, you know, the future of work, as we call it? Well, I think so. this is, let's forget the healthcare crisis because three months, six months, a year from at some point in time, we'll be out of it. So, so let me kind of take it. Once I define the job as a series of performance objectives, that's called OKRs, objectives and key results, or KPOs, key performance objectives, that define the work, five or six things define 80% of the work. Um, when I look for candidates, I look for three things. Number one is performance qualified. Can this person do that work that needs to be done? Number two is, does the person have what I call the achiever pattern, meaning recognized for doing exceptional work that needs to be done? And recognition could be assigned to a big project because they're good, being assigned to a big team and then being asked to do assigned other similar teams. I know the other is a good person. And would this candidate see this job as a career move? Meaning they would clearly see this as a, put them on a faster career trajectory. I guess that goes that way. I'm not positive how that goes, sorry. Uh, um, but then there's also, while all those are important, what equally is important is what I call the fit factors. Is the person intrinsically motivated to do that work? 
because it might make all sense, but if the person doesn't want to do that work, there'll be failure. Does the person fit with the manager's style? That's a critical issue. Anybody can say they want a cultural fit, but 50% of the culture is that manager who he or she works with. That manager is a, a strong manager, strong leader, can develop people, that's great, but so many managers are not like that. Uh, so if manager's not good at developing people, the person better be good at dealing with that kind of manager. So that's a very important part of the fit factor. Cultural fit is also important. And in my mind, cultural fit, it has to do with the pace of the organization. You can say it's values and all that, and I think that's a bunch of bull. Uh, it's not unimportant, but you can, proxy for that is pace of the organization, co a company growing fast, making quick decisions without a lot of resources is a fundamentally different culture than one that's slow paced, a lot of resources and decisions don't get made quickly. So if, you, if the person can meet on the intensity and pace level and is not a jerk, they'll fit with the culture. I have to guarantee they'll fit with the culture. And then you say, well, how do you figure it's not a jerk? Well, if the person's been assigned to teams, uh, cross-functional teams and people on those teams ask this person to be assigned again to the teams I guarantee, and the person uh, continues to grow and develop teams and has hired other people uh, from other companies, the person's not a jerk. If the person's all doing the same thing with the same people and never got another job, I would be concerned about that person. So I think people overdo, they look at the wrong facts to make it, and these are critical decisions, uh, but they use the wrong information to make those decisions. So again, I, uh, I believe it's very critical to make not only competent and motivated and career move, but also the fit factors are critical. You put all those together and you will likely hire someone uh, for the anniversary date. And that's what I call win-win hiring. Win-win means the hiring manager says, great person, candidate says, great job, I'm glad I took it. And there's a lot of activities and a lot of work that goes on there, but I think there's a lot of superficialities and a lot of mistakes that people make by looking at the wrong information to make critical decisions. Absolutely, so create a win-win situation out of everything that you see and do you believe that eq is more important than iq do you look for more of eq than iq well again that goes back to the um what i just said about the cultural fit and the team fit team fit is critical but i don't measure eq by my own assessment of emotional quotient i measure by how other people have reacted to that person so during my interview, I asked the candidate, hey, tell me about the biggest team you've been on. Did you volunteer for that team or did someone assign you to that team? If you volunteered, why? And if someone signed you, why? Who was on the team? And I go through all the details of the team results, how they influenced people. I said, what happened at the end of that team? Did you get others assigned to it? And they said, no, I, did. I got on a different team. And well, right away, I have an EQ call. And not, not me making the judgment about that person's EQ, about how friendly or warm they are. I'm making the judgment about how other people who have worked with that person made it. So if a person has been assigned to cross-functional teams and then that a leader of that team wanted this person on another team and six months later that person was hired to work for a former boss on another team, I know they have good EQ. It wouldn't have happened. So I, I, too many people put their own biases and judgment of what that looks like. That's not an interview. I, I look at the Sherlock Holmes interview. Is there enough evidence about all these things by looking at what other people thought of that person? If the person's a good technical person, they've been assigned a good technical project. If they're a good team person, they've been assigned to cross-functional teams and they've led cross-functional teams. And pe people have asked them to lead the team or asked them to be on this other team. You start seeing a pattern of that, you know what's important. And if uh, and whether it's more important than IQ, I, that, to me, it's not the end. That doesn't matter. What matters is, does the evidence show that this person is capable? If the person's brilliant and has never been on another cross-functional team and people don't want to work with them, uh, who cares? On the other hand, if the person's got a great functional uh, EQ and is an idiot, who cares? <laughs> they're both in balance and you, you get them both from the work the person's assigned, why they've assigned it, and the projects they've been assigned to and the teams that gives you all the information you need in balancing IQ and EQ properly. Right, so it's the deductive style of interviewing that really helps. You call, it, you call it deductive, I call it the Sherlock Holmes technique, but you're 100% right. Right, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. And can you help us understand how important of a role will technology and digital make in the inclusive workplace of the future? Do you believe robo hiring has a future? Yes and no. The problem is that the people who do the robo hiring don't know human nature. 
They don't understand how people make decisions. So most of the technology is feeding and trying to be efficient using incorrect data, like how many years experience the person has, how many skills they have, what school they went to. I look at, when I look at a resume, and I look at thousands, if not tens of thousands, I look at the rate of progression. I look at the teams the company's been on. I look at what I call recognition for doing superior work in that field. I do not see technology fully adapting to how good people change jobs and are successful. I see how they look at the masses, uh, so that I don't think they're looking at the right data. So yes, I absolutely believe it makes a, it could be very effective. But bottom line, a the best people you can is because you've converted that stranger to an acquaintance before you decide to make that person a candidate. Take a stranger, make an acquaintance, and then you make them a candidate. But if you skip that acquaintance part, you and you don't know the job and you don't know all these other factors, you're not going to get there. So can technology make a, uh, a critical piece of this? Absolutely. But it's not designed, in my mind, what I've seen for how good people make decisions and how the right people are hired for the long term. They're hired for getting people starting on the start date. And that, to me, is a different job mm -hmm. and a different role. I'm focusing on the anniversary date, not the start date. Totally different decision. So have you in your career seen, you know, an increase in the use of technology from then to now? And you, you do think that in the future also there would be human intervention that would be required, right? Well, let's say this. I, I have this cartoon, if I can find it. Um, let me see if I can find it. That I had drawn in 1998, which was the state of technology in 1998. Let's see if I can find it. Do it this way. So I had a. Um, can you see this cartoon? Yes. This cartoon was drawn in 1998. Wow. At the state of technology in 1998, people were spending all these money for job postings. They're building applicant tracking systems. Had websites, career sites. They still posted boring jobs, cumbersome websites. Nobody knew how to interview. Weak recruiters, bad systems, long process. And to me, it was a waste of time. I asked people. I bring this cartoon out every year and look at what's changed. So I look at all the technology, nothing's changed. Gallup still talks, and for 25 years, Gallup has been conducting employee engagement and satisfaction surveys. In 1998, employee satisfaction for newly hired people was about 35% fully satisfied with their job. It is no different today. And the answer is, is because people are focusing on the wrong stuff. Being efficient using technology to do the wrong things faster winds up with nothing. And so, so my philosophy is, no, it's terrible. Change the, change the paradigm. Focus on a year later, not the start date. Don't let everybody apply who's not qualified. The reason we have to spend so much technology is because we've made applying for a job free. Just apply. Push a button. Now you got all this overhead you got to get rid of. So we use technology to get rid of all these people who shouldn't apply to begin with. I approached uh, a major job board and said, why don't you only let candidates apply to five jobs a week? And they would, they only had five. And all of a sudden, if you only had five jobs, they would take those seriously as opposed to just pushing the apply button. They would actually say, hmm, and maybe don't let them apply. Maybe have them submit a little summary of work they've done that's related to the job. So, that's not happening. So your question about technology is, until they understand human nature and what problems are doing the wrong thing faster, this is 22 years later. 22 years later and nothing's changed. If nothing changes 22 years from now, I won't be around. You will be. I will not be around 22 years from now. I can guarantee this cartoon will still be relevant. Oh, wow. Which is pretty sad. So that's my, that's my position. It is. It's indeed really, really sad. It's amazing how nothing at all has changed from then to now. And there is, all, I think there's always a dearth of good recruiters and that still holds true from then to now. How do you, how do you improve the situation? I mean, you're trying to do that. You're trying to train so many people. But is there a fundamental issue with people's mindsets or... Is there something that we're missing out here? Yeah, and I, uh, I was hoping to have this other slide here, but it doesn't have it. I basically make the statement. Let me just go. Let me get out of here. Sorry. Now I'm getting into this. 
Um, I don't want to stop this there. Let me just see if I can go backwards. Um, I make the statement that the, at the fundamental level, there's a strategy challenge. Most companies who work and build this technology and companies who post jobs and companies who job boards who sell job postings are focusing on what I would say a strategy that assumes there's a surplus of great talent. And our job is there's a surplus of great talent, people will apply, we'll weed out the weak ones and a few great ones will remain. Well, I make the contention that a surplus of talent model like that is not effective when there is not a surplus of good talent. And I've been in the hiring game for 50 years. I first manager in 1972. I think, is that right? Yeah, 1972. First manager. There weren't good people there. You had to work real hard to recruit good talent. Last week, there weren't good talent. So nobody, there's never a good talent. So I say you should use a scarcity of talent model to attract the best, not a surplus of talent to weed out the weak. And most technology is designed to efficiently weed out the weak, and it won't matter how efficient you are and how much AI you are. You focus, you have the wrong strategy. You've got to identify great people, convert strangers into acquaintances, convince them and uh, convince their families and their hiring manager and the team that this is the right person for the right job and it puts that person on a better career trajectory. That is can be done with technology. People are doing bits and pieces of it, but by and large, people are, and as far as I'm concerned, get rid of job boards. Uh, why would you post an individual job? They're impossible to find a job. Uh, put a little cluster together of all jobs related to each other and let the system figure out, hey, you're a good candidate. What have you done well? We'll figure out the job is best for you rather than you trying to apply to a job that you can't even find the right job for you. So to me, that's what technology should do. We'll find, we use technology, hey, here's all our jobs in a company. Here's the candidate. We'll figure out, we'll build the matching behind uh, the scenes so the candidate doesn't have to figure out which who's the promoted job or which job or how many 500 different jobs they are. I mean, it's just, so you think about the overhead involved for candidates and companies alike, you can almost say that it's silly. It's just when somebody looks at it um, re, re, rationally, you say the whole idea is dumb. Nothing's changed from that bucket from 22 years ago. Sorry for that long rant for a question. No, no, I completely understand your frustration. It's really, really surprising. You know, those stats remain the same for so many years. It's just that we have to learn from this. We really have to. And, you know, talking a little bit more about the future, right? So how do you believe the gig economy is going to evolve, especially when you consider the growing ranks of millennials in our workforce? Well, I think sadly, I think the gig economy could be effective for a certain group of people if they want to work a gig. But I tell the person who wants to work a gig, we recognize you're not, that's all you're going to be doing the rest of your life is working these gigs. They might get a little bit better, but you're not going to get more management, bigger projects because you're focusing on a narrow component of a problem. And that could be very fine. And I'm certainly fine with that. In California, they basically said you can't work gigs uh, because they said everybody has to be a, an employee uh, getting benefits and uh, all the tax laws in the United States, et cetera, et cetera. So it prevents people who want to work gigs from being a gig worker. Uh, and I think that to me is a fundamental stupid decision that the politicians made in the state of California, which we'll probably make elsewhere. Now, the people who are in the gigs making low wages are saying, well, uh, we should get full benefits. Yes, but you also affected people who are making 75 to $100 an hour who aren't in that class. So they made it universal for everybody has got to be an employee and they're not getting hired. So now you've just basically taken jobs away from people. So I, I am not optimistic about the future of hiring uh, because I think you got politicians involved, you got technology focused on the wrong strategy, you got company executives who have short-term perspectives. You got to, hey, I got to make my quarterly numbers. Uh, so I don't think a lot of people think long-term about these whole consequences. So quite frankly, I am not optimistic about the future um, in, in the total societal level. I think individuals got to fight the battle for themselves and there are ways to do that. But that's how I believe it. Sorry for that somewhat pessimistic thing, but I look 22 years later and I don't see anything improving. I just see people selling job postings and technology that's flawed, but it makes things slightly better, not really better. So that's the thought. Yeah, it's probably just for their um, you know, own satisfaction that they're doing things and not really being inclusive about 
other people and uh, kind of siloed thinking as I would think. Uh, and that, that's pretty- 100% right. I love that term. That's what it is. It's not thinking the whole process is a silo, not thinking the big picture is a silo. So it's a, a perfect analogy. Too many silos and competing silos. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that is that is sad, and I hope we can make a change with that. Um, well, I just like to you know end this with the last question. If you would have any important sound bites that you would like our, uh, like to leave our viewers with. Well, it depends. If you're a, a recruiter, my message is don't sell smoke and mirrors. Know the job. If you're a hiring manager, make sure your recruiters ask you this question or you answer this question before you start looking for people. What does it take to be successful in this job? And it will, you'll come out with five or six OKRs, objectives and key results that define the work. If you're a candidate looking for a job and the, you're clearly the hiring manager, the recruiter doesn't know that, you ask this question. What does it take for me to be, if the person hired in this job to be successful? What kind of work is this person going to be doing? And what would you recognize that work is? What, is, what does it take to be successful in that work? I call that a fourth choice question. And then if you're a candidate, give an answer. Well, here's something I've done that's related to that. That's why at least candidates can be ensured they're taking the right job for the right reasons and are hired for the right reasons. So everybody should be involved, but hiring candidates have to take responsibility for themselves by forcing uh, the hiring manager and a company to define success as a series of projects and then making sure that they're competent and motivated to do that work. They do those things, they'll be a little bit better off, but it's gotta be a put your own self-interest in mind. And by doing that, you'll actually be demonstrating that yourself that you're a more discriminating candidate. So you're more likely to get the job that way and more likely to be the job that you want. So that's my advice. All right, thank you so much for that summary. I think it was very very insightful and i'm sure a lot of people would benefit from that and you know it was a, a pleasure talking to you Lou. i really appreciate your time and sharing your views with us it's really been a really good learning enriching experience for me personally great thank you very much it was fun to be here stay stay healthy bye-bye now bye-bye take care